Chapter 17 will be looking at advanced issues in revenue recognition. The specific learning objectives are, we'll look at how we understand and explain the core principle of revenue recognition, how a company identifies a contract with a customer, what's a performance obligation, how a company determines a transaction price of a contract, how to allocate that transaction price to the performance obligations, and how we'll account for the revenue once all those items are identified. The final area of the chapter will be looking at long-term contracts and how we recognize revenue related to those types of transactions. So when a company enters into a sales contract with a customer, it receives that right to consideration from the customer while also assuming a performance obligation to transfer goods or services. So there's two parts to the contract. Revenues are recognized when the company's net position in the contract increases as it satisfies a performance obligation. Revenues, remember, are increases in assets or settlements of liabilities like unearned revenue um, when the company delivers a product or service. It implies an asset or liability approach to revenue recognition in which revenues are recognized and measured based on changes in assets and liabilities. However, as we just stated, we're looking more towards when performance obligation occurs and the transfer of goods or services to a customer has occurred. So the five steps to revenue recognition, and these are very new, they came out in the last five years. We get very specific with when and how we determine revenue. The step one, we identify the contract. So is there a contract with the customer? In step two, we identify what we have to do in that contract. What are the separate performance obligations? In step three, we determine what's the transaction price overall on the contract. Step four, we allocate that transaction price to the different performance obligations. And then as we complete the various performance obligations in the contract, that's when we recognize revenue. Certain things are excluded from the revenue recognition. A new revenue recognition standard applies to all contracts with customers, but excludes certain types of contracts, transactions, and arrangements that are in other standards. This includes leases, which is discussed in Chapter 20, insurance contracts, financial instruments, guarantees, non-monetary exchanges between companies. And it also excluded our items such as interest and dividends that are part of a company's ordinary activities. So we're not um, focused on all revenue recognition, but the parts where there's a contract and performance obligations are being um, completed. So the first step is identifying a contract with a customer. Who's a customer? That's the party that has entered into the contract with the company to obtain goods or services from that company. The contract is that legal agreement between two or more parties that creates enforceable rights and obligations. So if you don't complete the requirements of a contract, you can be sued. It could be written, oral, or even implied by your normal business practices. So a company should only apply the revenue recognition standard to contracts that meet all the following criteria. One, all the parties to the contract approve the contract, either in writing, orally, or just being a part of the contract, implication. And they commit to performing their required obligations in the contract. The company is able to identify each party's rights regarding the goods or services to be transferred. So the legal rights of both 
the company is able to identify payment terms for the goods or services that are going to be transferred, but does not imply that the transaction price has to be fixed or explicitly stated, so it may not be within the contract. The contract has commercial substance. This means the contract must change the timing amount or probability of the future cash flows of the company. And it is probable that the company will collect from the customer when the goods or services are exchanged. So you need all those requirements in order to apply those five steps. Now, there are issues in identifying a contract. Termination rights. Let's take a look at this. A contract does not qualify for revenue recognition and no revenue can be recognized if the contract is not performed. And either party can unilaterally cancel the contract before performance without compensating the other party. A wholly unperformed contract, what is this? It's one in which the seller has not transferred goods or services, nor has it received or is entitled to receive any money for those goods or services. So nothing was done. If, when signed, the contract terms allow cancellation without penalty by either party at any time, the contract doesn't qualify for revenue recognition and no journal entry is required when it is signed because they don't have to do the requirements of the contract and there's no penalty involved. However, once they start performing the requirements of the contract, then a journal entry may, may be made um, if somebody does not complete their required part of the contract. <sighs> Combining contracts. So a company must combine two or more contracts and account for them as a single contract if it enters into the contracts at or near the same time with the same customer and one or more of the following are met. The company negotiates the contract as a package. The amount of consideration to be paid in one contract is dependent on the price or the performance of the other contract, so they're related. All or some of the goods or services promised in the contracts comprise a single performance obligation. So maybe you have two separate contracts, but you're really doing combining those to one service or they cover one delivery of a product. So the key objective is to combine these contracts when the economics of the revenues to be recognized from the transaction can only be understood with reference to the arrangement as a whole. So you really can't separate the revenues. Even though they're on two separate contracts, if they meet these criteria, they're viewed as one contract. Modifications, another issue when you're identifying a contract. A change order or contract modification is when you agree upon a change in the goods or services that are to be delivered from the original contract and also the price. What happens with these? Well, the seller accounts for a contract modification as a separate contract if both the following conditions are met. The modification adds, adds promised goods or services that are distinct from the original contract. And you can separate it from the original contract. So they're adding a different type and delivery schedule of the product or services. And so you need both of these. The price of the contract increases by an amount of consideration that reflects the entity standalone selling price of that additional promised good. So it truly is a separate contract. You, um, it's being viewed as um, if you just bought that product, you would be charged the same as you would under the change order. So you need both of those conditions to be met in order um, for it to be viewed as a separate contract. If they aren't present, then it's part of the original contract.
So here's a great flow chart that demonstrates all these different items we just talked about with modifications. So the first question there is, does the contract modification add distinct goods and services? If the answer is yes, go down. Does the contract price increase by an amount that reflects a standalone selling price? If the answer is yes, then we account for the contract as a new separate contract. Of course, if the answer is no there, you can see. Um, are, the next question is, are the remaining goods or services distinct? If the answer is yes, we account for the contract using a prospective method that we'll look at. If the answer is no, we account for the contract modification using a cumulative catch-up method. So as you can see, we get very detailed and specific with how we take care of items in a contract. If the contract modification does not create a separate contract, it is accounted for using either, as we just said, a prospective method in which the modification results in essentially a new contract going forward. So you have the old contract, but adding in that new part creates a whole new contract or a cumulative catch up adjustment. And this is one in which the old contract is adjusted to reflect the modifications. When the remaining goods or services that are to be delivered are distinct from the goods and service in the original contract, a prospective approach is used. So the seller accounts for the modification as if the original contract is terminated and a new contract is created, just as I say, stated. So we say, okay, old contract gone, add in the modification, new contract, and we deal with the new contract going forward. We don't affect anything from the past. So if there was any kind of performance obligations met that we already recorded the revenue on, we ignore them. So let's look at an example. Patrick Manufacturing agrees to sell 500 t-shirts to Jane Company for $7,000, $14 a shirt. After 400 t-shirts have been delivered, so he's already delivered some, Patrick and Jane modify the agreement to sell an additional 200 sweatshirts for $1,005 each, which is significantly lower than Patrick's standalone selling price. So, because the selling price does not reflect the standalone selling price of the goods, this modification would not be considered a separate contract. We take a prospective approach. Instead, be, um, Patrick will account for the goods as if the original contract is terminated and a new one is created. The $1,400 of revenue remaining because um, of the 500 t-shirts, 100 are still to be delivered from the original contract. So the 1,400 of revenue remaining is combined with the revenue related to the modifications, a thousand. And Patrick will recognize revenue of eight dollars per shirt. Now what does how do we get that? Well, if you take you gotta get yourself a little scratch paper there. If you take the fourteen hundred and the thousand, twenty four hundred what does that cover? How many shirts? 300 shirts. So you're getting an average price per shirt, adding in the new contract total. So $2,400 is the total revenue you'll be recognizing once this change occurs on 300 shirts. So that's $8 per shirt. And that's how the revenue will be recognized, modifying the contract under a prospective approach. Why? Because the standalone selling price the new selling price, that $5, is not at the standalone selling price. If it was, it would be a separate contract. Let's take a look at the cumulative catch-up. What if instead Patrick agrees to sell 500 t-shirts to Jane again after 400 have been delivered, Patrick and Jane modify the contract to reduce the price of the remaining 100 t-shirts to only $9 per share. So now they're not adding in a new product, they're just reducing the price 
So this is when you're using a cumulative catch-up because the selling price does not involve distinct goods. This is not a separate contract. It's not like before, before we we're adding more t-shirts. So in this um, situation, Patrick should use a cumulative catch-up approach. What he'll do will, is he'll say, okay, Patrick will account for the goods as if the original contract specified total revenues of $6,500 an average of $13 per shirt. Patrick should therefore only recognize $5,200 in revenues for the 400 shirts it has already delivered. Okay, I'm just going through my mind here. Okay, so 400 shirts times $14. Um, just give me a second. <laughs> Gives you, so what did he sell already? 400 shirts at $14, 5,600. Okay. If the remaining shirts, the remaining 100 shirts are sold at $9, That'll be only an additional 900 in revenue. So what is the actual total revenue he can recognize? 6,500 overall. Well, find a new average price, selling price. 6,500 divided by 500 shirts that, because you'll make 6,500 selling a total of 500 shirts. So if you take the 6,500 divided by 500, the average selling price per shirt then is now $13. So this is how you apply the cumulative catch-up. First, what did you actually sell? I sold 400 shirts at $14 each. So that revenue is there, $5,600. When we sell the additional 100 shirts of the 500, we're only charging $9. So what's the revenue there? $6,500. So really, what's the selling price on those $6,500 of, of revenue? Well, divide by 500 shirts, $13 each. So the amount of revenue they should recognize on those first 400 shirts is only $13 each. Okay, so if he has already, which would only be $5,200, if he has already um, shown that revenue at $14 each, he needs to reduce it by $400. So that demonstrates your perspective and your catch up when you have that situation on a contract. The next issue relates to um, collectability. For a contract to be considered potential revenue recognition, it must be probable that the seller will collect the money for those goods and services that's from the customer. This requires the company to really examine collectability. So any amount that the seller does not expect to collect results in a reduction of the contract price. The seller should use the adjusted price as the starting point to apply the remaining steps of the revenue recognition model. Okay. So take a good read through that first part, those learning objectives one and two, to really get a good understanding of them. Now, the performance obligation. That's our next part, identifying them. A performance obligation is a promise in a contract with a customer to transfer goods or services. So the promise may be explicit, such that a source document details the terms of it, or the promise may be implicit and establish a constructive obligation. What does this mean? The seller creates a compelling expectation that it will provide the goods or services due to its customary business practices it's already established. In addition, performance obligations do not have to be legally enforceable. So, examples. Building, design, manufacturing, or creating an asset on behalf of a customer. Transferring goods or reselling purchased goods. 
granting a right to use an intangible asset. These are all examples of performance obligations. Standing ready to provide goods or services in the future. Performing contractually agreed upon tasks. Arranging for another party to transfer goods or services. So the proper identification of the performance obligation is a critical step in this revenue recognition model because the satisfaction of that performance obligation determines when to record revenue and how much to record it at. So identifying these is key. Is a good or service distinct? Well, a promised good or service is considered distinct if it has both of these characteristics. It's capable of being distinct. The customer is able to benefit from the good or service either on its own or with other resources that are available to them. It's distinct within the context of the contract because the seller's promise to transfer the goods or service is separately identified from other promises in the contract. So indicators that a promise is separately identified are the lack of significant integration with other goods or services. So we're going to sell you a photocopier. That's distinct. The goods or service does not significantly modify or customize another good or service promised in the contract. And the good or service is not highly dependent on or interrelated with the other goods or services. So it's distinct if it's capable of being distinct and it is distinct within the context of the contract. If it meets any of those items below, um, it may not be considered distinct. Is a promise identifiable? In determining whether it is, the seller would include yes, it is, if. These are the what you want to look at. The good or service is not significantly integrated with other promised goods or services offered by the seller. So it's not de super dependent on one another. Can't have one without the other. The good or service does not significantly modify or customize another good or service. The good or service is not highly dependent on or interrelated with other promised goods or services. So there, it's not a, if you do, if you buy this, then you can buy this kind of situation. Upfront payments. What do we do with these? Well, upfront payments are payments from a customer before the product or service is delivered, including non-refundable setup fees, initiation fees, or membership fees, payments for goods or services to be redeemed at the customer's request. Gift cards are an example of that. Payment for goods and services to be delivered in the future, such as fares for flights or cruises, season tickets, insurance premiums. So all those prepaid items we have to make um, would be considered upfront payments. When a company does receive an upfront payment, it must determine the performance obligation to which this upfront fee relates. And remember, we don't recognize revenue on that upfront payment until the obligation is completed. So for an airline, it would be the flight is completed, the cruise, the cruise is completed. Insurance, the insurance time has lapsed. Licensing. Licenses provide customers access to a seller's intellectual property. Revenue from licensing poses two unique challenges. The seller must identify whether the performance obligation associated with a license is distinct. And the sellers must determine if the license provides access to the intellectual property throughout the license period. And those that do provide use of the intellectual property as it exists at the point in time when the license is granted. So we're looking at very specific items related to licensing. A principal agent contract consideration. So these are all the separate types of considerations we have to look at when looking at performance obligations. You need to ID 
the company's performance obligation when it comes to a principal agent relationship. Now, what is that? The principal's performance obligation is to provide a good or service to customers, while an agent's performance obligation is to arrange for goods or services to be provided by the principal to the customer. So no single indicator is more important than another and management must use judgment in assessing if it is a principal or an agent relationship that they have. So more complexity adding to identifying information in our contract. Let's look at some of the indicators that a company might be an agent. Another company is primarily responsible for fulfilling the contract. So you enter into, you, two companies enter, company A and company B enter into a contract. Company A's contract to company B says company C will install a fence. So there's another company who's responsible for fulfilling that contract. The company does not have inventory risk before and after the goods have been ordered by a customer during shipping or upon return. So again, company A and company B um, get into a contract that company C will provide them with goods. The company does not have discretion in establishing prices for the goods and services. And the company's consideration is the form of a commission. So their company A is receiving a commission because they helped company C get business. If management concludes based on the answers to these indicators that it is an agent, then it would recognize commission revenue because that's what they're receiving for the consideration retained after paying the principal for the goods or services provided to the customer. So in this case, what we're saying is company A buys stuff off of company C sells it to company B, and all they're responsible for revenue-wise is the commission. That's what they will recognize as revenue. If the company is deemed to be the principal, though, it would recognize the gross amount as revenue. They're the ones providing the goods or services. So it all depends on what um, relationship they have, principal or agent. agent you're just um, recording commissions. Principal, you're recording the sale as revenue. So that's performance obligations and the funky things that could happen with those. Now let's look at the transaction price itself. So remember, we have five steps here. So the third step is how much is the transaction price? The amount of consideration the seller expects to be entitled to in exchange for the goods or services. So how much um, will they receive in, in money or stock or other assets to satisfy the sale? Often the transaction price is easy because it's usually fixed and it's stated right in the contract. However, there are other situations the seller must take into account factors that affect transaction price. And there it is, time value of money. If the payment is going to be $10,000 a year for five years, how much is that money worth in terms of today? So we would need to do a time value of money calculation. Variable considerations, non-cash considerations. So you're not paying cash, you're paying um, with stock. You know, you're receiving stock as part of the payment. And consideration payable to the customer. So let's take a look at these individually. So when a customer pays a seller either well before or well after the goods are transferred, a sales contract contains a significant financing component and the seller determines the transaction price, so how much was the actual sale amount, sale amount by discounting that promised amount of future consideration. The seller should use the same discount rate or interest rate it would use if it were to enter into a loan agreement or a separate financing transaction with that customer. In effect, the contract is separated into a revenue element and an interest element. Take a look at an example here. In January 1, Beckham Company sold goods to Adams Company in exchange for a three-year non-interest bearing note with a face value of $20,000. So at the end of three years, 
Adams will pay Beckham $20,000. They normally, the appropriate discount rate or interest rate used would have been 12%. Remember, non-interest bearing just means that there's no stated interest rate on the contract, but there is an interest component. So we need to determine what's that $20,000 worth if they paid it today instead of at the end of three years. So we need to discount that $20,000, assuming a 12% interest rate, three years. So your N is three, your I is 12%. Use your present value of one table. So really, the transaction price would be $14,235.60. The journal entry would be debit note receivable, 20 grand. You will be receiving 20 grand at the end of three years. Credit discount on notes receivable for the interest component, the difference between the 14,235.60 and the 20,000. So instead of receiving that interest over time, you're gonna receive it all in one lump sum at the end of three years. Remember, we don't show all of that as interest income though in the year the loan occurs. We show it over that three-year period. So we store the interest income in discount on notes receivables, a contra account to notes receivables. And there should be a credit to sales revenue of $14,235.60. Now, at the end of the year, how much of that interest will Beckham record? Well, they will determine um, the carrying value of the loan, which is 20,000 minus the balance in the discount on notes receivable, 5764.40. So the current balance that Adam still owes them is 14,235.60. Multiply that by the 12% interest rate. So in the first year, they will debit the discount on notes receivable, decrease it, for the portion of the interest income they're required to recognize in the first year, 1708.27, and then credit the interest income account to show that. And there's your sales revenue popped up now. Variable consideration. That's how we handle time value of money. Let's look at variable consideration. The amount of consideration expected to be received from the customer may be uncertain due to contract terms, um, things like incentives, discounts, allowances, rebates, penalties. All of these things could affect the actual co uh, price on the contract. So to determine the transaction price when there is variable consideration, two things you need to do. First, estimate the total amount it expects to be entitled. How much do we expect to get? Two, determine whether there is an applicable constraint on the variable consideration. A contract term that could cause the amount of consideration received to be less than the amount expected. So is there something that um, allows them to return stuff or uh, provide them allowances or rebates? Companies should not recognize revenues now if they could be significantly reduced later when the uncertainty is resolved. So when you have variable consideration and these types of items, you should hold off on recognizing revenue until the time period is up re, um, related to these items. To estimate the variable consideration though, a company uses either the expected value approach or the most likely amount approach. The expected value approach is when a company identifies the range of possible outcomes and the probabilities associated with them and then calculates expected value, so how much they expect to get, as the sum of the probability weighted amounts in the range. So yeah, you're doing some statistics there. The most likely amount approach is when the consideration is the single most likely possible variable consideration amount. So the approach used is not a free choice, but the approach that provides the best prediction of the amount you're going to receive is what you use.
So how do we assess whether an applicable constraint even exists? So once the variable consideration has been estimated, a company may only include it in the transaction price to the extent that it is probable that a significant reversal of the revenue previously recognized will not occur. This constraint on variable consideration is aimed at preventing over-recognizing revenue in one period and reversing it in the next. I mean, we're just trying to um, get as close as possible to actual revenue for that period of time. So take a read through that um, in your book. Non-cash consideration. Here's another item we need to worry about when looking at consideration. If the customer promises consideration in a form other than cash, the seller includes the fair value of the non-cash in the transaction price. If we're unable to estimate the fair value of that non-cash item, it should estimate the fair value indirectly based on the standalone selling price of the promised good or service. So what does it usually, what's its usual value? How much does it usually sell for? So if it's a car, we would look at that. Stock, you would look at stock price. If customers contribute goods or services to a company in order to assist in the fulfillment of a seller's performance obligation, and if the seller has control of the customer's contributed goods or services, it should include the customer's contribution in the transaction price, because they're really so if a customer has to, um, you know, use their backhoe for you to um, complete your service or, your, your, or provide them a product, you just increase the selling price for the value of them using their backhoe. So you have to include that in the transaction price. Part of that should be revenue as well. What about consideration payable to a customer? What does this mean? If a seller pays or expects to pay amounts to their customer, the seller accounts for that as a reduction in the transaction price. If the payment is for a distinct good or service that the customer transfers to the seller, then the payment is accounted for in the same way as other purchases from suppliers. For example, a seller offers a $200 rebate to customers that purchase a $2,000 product. So here's where they're promising to pay them consideration if they um, purchase this product. So how much is the actual sales revenue? Well, the company will debit cash for $2,000. They promise them a $200 rebate, so they credit rebate liability then they credit sales revenue for the difference. Now that rebate will be used in the future. What if the customer never uses the rebate? Well, at that point, you debit rebate liability and credit sales revenue because your sale revenue was in fact $2,000. But if they do use that rebate, you have properly recorded at the date of the sale, the $1,800 of sales revenue. So that's what happens if we promise something, um, a payment of some kind to a customer. So those are some of the um, unique things that could happen when determining the transaction price. How do we allocate the transaction price when we have more than one performance obligation in a contract? So now we're in step four. So once the performance obligations have been identified, that's step two, and you determine the transaction price, that's step three, the seller must allocate those transaction prices to the performance obligations. Because the distinct performance obligations are considered separate units in accounting, revenue is recognized for each performance obligation as it's satisfied. So we look at it when we're, when we're actually doing is we credit revenue when we've done that part of the contract. The seller allocates the transaction price to each performance obligation in proportion to the relative standalone selling price of those goods and services. So it's very similar to if we buy more than one asset for one price. We allocate the price we paid 
based on the fair values of those assets. It's the same scenario here. GAP suggests the three approaches to obtain an estimate of standalone prices, if you don't have one, is use the adjusted market assessment approach. This requires the seller to consider the market in which the good or service is sold and estimate the price that a customer in that market would be willing to pay for just that item. Another method is the expected cost plus a margin approach. So the seller forecasts unobservable standalone price. And this is only estimating when you don't have a standalone price by estimating the cost of satisfying the obligation and then adding a little bit on top for your gross profit. And then the residual approach is another method you may use. It involves deducting the total transaction price, the estimated standalone prices of other goods and service in the contract, and determine the residual. So if you have three performance obligations, you know two of the standalone prices. Just subtract them and whatever's left you assign to the third. The, the next item is when do you um, recognize revenue? Well, we said the seller must determine when a performance obligation is satisfied. And that's when you recognize revenue. A seller satisfies a performance obligation by transferring control of a promised good or service to a customer. A performance obligation is satisfied at either a point in time or over time, just like we always have seen it with revenue. It's just that now, instead of um, recording everything at once, in a contract, we now break it down into these separate obligations, assign pricing to them, and then recognize them when they occur. For a performance obligation to be satisfied over time, you must have at least one of the following three criteria. The customer simultaneously receives and consumes the benefits of the seller's performance as the seller performs. Magazine subscriptions for a, for a magazine company. The seller's performance creates or enhances an asset that the customer controls as the asset is created or enhanced. That is more along the lines of um, they're building a uh, addition onto a warehouse. The company satisfying that is building it on the customer's land. The seller's performance does not create an asset with an alternative use to the seller. So we must have at least one of these three in order, uh, I'm sorry, in order for them to be um, recognized over a period of time. If not, it's a point in time. So let's look at obligations that are satisfied over time. The seller must measure its progress towards complete satisfaction of the obligation to determine how much revenue they should recognize. There's a couple different ways of determining that. The first is output methods. So we measure progress over time based on the results achieved to date compared to the total expected achievement. So we've produced 9,000 coffee cups we expect to produce 100,000 coffee cups. Output methods use direct measures of the value of the goods and services transferred to the customer during completion of the contract. Input methods is another way. Measure progress over time based on the seller's efforts to satisfy the performance obligation. We've spent $50,000 so far, we expect to spend 200,000. So it's based on how much the seller is inputting into that performance obligation. Theoretically, output methods are preferable because they provide a more faithful representation of progress because you're actually, this um, customer is receiving stuff. Two important or two popular input methods are as follows. Cost to cost method, and we're gonna take a more detailed look at that in a few minutes. We measure progress towards satisfaction of the obligation by comparing the cost we've spent to date with how much we expect to spend overall. The efforts expended measure 
uh, measures progress towards the satisfaction of the obligation by the work performed to date, labor hours, labor dollars, machine hours, or material quantities. So it's just a different um, method of determining how much revenue you need to recognize due to either the effort expended or the cost you've incurred. So how do we recognize revenue? We determine the progress by a percentage. We multiply that by the overall transaction price. Okay, that's been allocated to that performance obligation. So how much revenue should we recognize in total from that performance obligation? As we finish that project, we recognize the portion of revenue incurred this year. So that's why any revenue recognized from prior periods is subtracted. And we'll take a look at that. This is the classic example of the cost to cost method. It's been around forever and it's not something brand new that came out with revenue recognition. On January 1, 2017, Grand Construction Company enters into a contract with a customer to build an office complex. They're going to charge them $25 million. It looks like it's taking them two years to complete the project. In the cost to cost method, Grand will recognize revenue as they complete this office complex based on how much they have spent their costs to date. So in 2017, they have spent 9.9 .9 million building the office complex. They estimate they're going to spend an additional 12,100,000 to complete it. So how much does it cost in total on their best estimate? $22 million. They're charging their customer 25 million. So they have a $3 million gross profit overall. They've completed 45% of the project. You, you determine that by taking the actual cost to date of 9.9 .9 million and dividing it by total cost expected of 22 million. In 2018, they actually only spend in total on the project between 17 and 18, 21 million. They don't expect to spend any more. So the total cost of the project was $21 million. And it is 100% complete by the end of 2018. How much revenue will they recognize each year? Well, in year one, 2017, they will recognize 45% of the $25 million as revenue, or $11,250,000. Next year, since the contract price is not changing, it is still $25 million, they will recognize the remaining $13,750,000. The amounts you see there of $22 million and $21 million are separate. That's the cost grand paid to make the building. The 25 million is what they charge the customer. So that's the cash they're bringing in. So you have to remember that. It's just that we use the cost to determine how much revenue to recognize. What about contract cost? A company may incur cost in obtaining or fulfilling a contract. Incremental costs are costs the seller incurred by obtaining the contract that would not have been incurred if they didn't have the contract. Incremental costs are capitalized as an asset when incurred and amortized using a method as consistent with recognition of revenue from the related contract. So for contracts where the amortization period would be less than one year, you just expense it. But if the contract's going to last five years, then you amortize those incremental costs over five years. You would debit an expense and credit the contract cost asset. Presentation issues. When a seller has satisfied a performance obligation but the customer has not paid them, the seller records either a receivable or a contract asset. So a receivable represents the unconditional right to receive consideration from a customer. Remember, that's an oral agreement. 
A contract asset arises when the seller's right to consideration from a customer is conditional upon something other than the passage of time. So maybe the customer still needs to do, or the uh, company still needs to do something else for the customer, or some um, goal needs to be met. A contract liability represents the seller's performance obligation and arises when a customer's payment of consideration occurs prior to the seller's performance under the contract. Well, we know that, that's unearned revenue. We receive the cash before we've done anything. What about disclosing information? Companies should disclose both qualitative and quantitative information about contracts with customers and any significant judgments about applying guidance, including disaggregation of revenue into categories that allow users to determine how revenue will affect be affected by economic factors. So they want to look at things such as good or service, the geography, the market, or the type of customers and type of contracts. So we break them down into those categories when we're disclosing this information on the financial statements. Reconciliation of the opening and closing balances of contract assets and liabilities. So in addition, qualitative and quantitative information about significant changes in contract balances should be disclosed. Companies should disclose, I'm sorry. Okay. Long-term contracts um, are our final area. They involve projects like we saw before, buildings, you're building a building, an airplane, a ship, a road, a bridge, dams, things that can take several years to complete. If you're the company who is providing this item in a long-term contract, we usually look at it as a single performance obligation. Building a bridge, building a boat, building a road. Which, it, um, which is normally satisfied over time because the buyer and seller obtain rights, including the right of the buyer to enforce specific performance. You gotta do it. The buyer usually makes progress payments while the contract is being performed. And the buyer has the right to take over the work if it's not completed. So if those things exist, we, recognize the revenue as it's being completed. How do we do this? Well, the company uses a special inventory asset account called construction in progress. So that's where we record all the project costs and gross profit recognized on the project at the end of each period. As the company completes portions of the projects, it may also bill the customer for partial payment for which the company debits a receivable account. So the debit accounts receivable and it credits an account called partial billings. Partial billings account. And this is actually a contra account to that construction in progress inventory account. So it'll reduce the balance in that account. This results in the net balance sheet amount being an asset if construction in progress. So the amount they've put in, the company's paid towards the project. And the, when I say the company, I mean the one constructing it. So remember what we keep in construction in progress, the cost of all the um, projects so far, plus the gross profit recognized so far. If you bill more than what's in that account, um, so if you bill more than what's in that account, you owe, it, it ends up being a liability on your balance sheet. If you bill less than what's in the construction in progress, you have an asset. Let's look at an example. Cameron Company contracted to construct a stadium that takes three years to complete. There's the various um, information on the construction costs, the estimate that the company thinks 
it will be to complete the project, how much they've billed the customer each year, how much the customer has paid, and the contract price, which is $700,000. And that's fixed. That doesn't change. That's what Cameron is charging their customer to construct the stadium, $700,000. So over the next three years, they will recognize in total $700,000 in revenue. Now, Cameron estimates the percentage completed using the cost to cost method like we saw in a couple slides ago. And there's the information. So let's see how this all jives out for them. In the first year, the company will first determine how much they've completed of the project by taking the cost they've paid so far in 2017 from the beginning of the project through the end of 2017, plus what they estimate it will cost to complete it. So you look at one year at a time here. So they determined that they think the total cost of this project will be $500,000. They've already paid a cost of 100,000. So 100,000 divided by 500,000, 20% of this project is completed. So how much revenue should a company recognize? 20% of the 700,000 or $140,000. And we'll show you the journal entries in a minute. They have not re recognized any revenue on this project yet, so they'll recognize all 140,000 in 2017. If we subtract the actual cost during 2017, the gross profit in the first year will be $40,000. So of that 140 that they've earned, they've had to pay cost of 40 of 100,000. So their actual gross profit for the first year is 40 grand. In year two, 2018, the costs to date, those costs to date include last year's cost of 100,000. And that's how we determine how much of the project is complete. We wanna know how much costs have been incurred since the beginning of the project through the end of the second year, 2018, 286,000. How much more do they expect to have to pay? Well, it's changed a little bit, 264,000. Now they feel the project will cost a total of 550,000. And that's just because prices increase, the economy changes, things change for them. So at the end of the second year, they take how much they've paid so far in the project of 286 over what they expect the project to cost in total, which it's okay if that changes, 550,000, 52% of this project is completed by the end of 2018. So by the end of 2018, this company should have recognized 52% of the 700,000 or 364,000. They've already recognized 140,000 of it. So how much revenue do they recognize this year? Only 224, the 364 minus the 140. How much in expenses did they actually pay for this year in 2018? Well, they've paid a total of 286 over the past two years. 100 was from last year, so only 186,000. So this year's gross profit is 38000 And in the final year, the total cost as of the end of the product project was 600000 It actually increased. They don't have any more costs, so the total costs are 600000 600 divided by 600, 100% of the project is complete. How much of the revenue should be recognized by the end of 2019? 700,000, 100% of it. They've already recognized 364, 140 from the first year, 224 of revenue from the second year. So how much revenue do they show in the third year? 336,000. How much costs happened in 2019? Well, of the 600,000, Subtract the cost that have been incurred through the end of last year, 286, 314,000 of it. So this year's gross profit would be 22,000. So if you take the 40 plus the 38 plus the 22, 
you get a gross profit on this project of $100,000. It's just not, not all shown in the year the stadium is completed. You show it over time as the project is being completed. And that's correct because the project um, contract price is 700,000 and the costs were 600 overall. Now, assume the same facts except Cameron determines that it cannot make reasonable, dependable estimates of the pro progress towards satisfaction of the obligation. Therefore, it recognizes the entire amount of revenue, expenses, and gross profit when the contract is completed. So sometimes this does occur. Therefore, they wouldn't show anything, no gross profit, in 2017 or 18. They would show all 100,000 in 2019. So, like I said, that could be a situation if you have a problem um, collecting information to spread out the gross profit over the three-year period. Now, how do we do the journal entries? Okay, if you recognize revenue over time, you will debit construction in progress to determine the costs. Okay, so first we're recording the cost, and you have to refer back to your table. The total cost of the project in the first year was 100,000. We don't debit stadium, we debit an inventory account called construction in progress. Credit, cash, accounts payable, what, whatever account needs to offset it. You have to debit accounts receivable and credit partial billings for the amount that you've billed the customer, that Cameron billed the customer. Remember, partial billings is a contra account to construction in progress. You debit cash and credit accounts receivable for the amount of money the customer actually sent you because they're paying down their balance and accounts receivable. Under the recognition over time, so all those journal entries are the same whether you use a point in time to recognize all gross profit or overtime. The major difference between the two methods is the last journal entry. In the year over time, you will debit construction expense, like cost of goods sold, construction expense for the cost of the materials that you paid so, for so far. You will credit revenue. So both those accounts are gonna appear on your income statement. That's how you show the 40,000. You need an offset, so you debit the asset inventory account construction in progress for the gross profit of $40,000. Since you're not recognizing anything under the point in time in the first year, there is no journal entry. So I encourage you to do T accounts and watch how this information um, flows through them, especially on the construction in progress and the partial billings. So in the first year, the construction in progress will have a $140,000 debit balance. The partial billings will have an $80,000 credit balance. So since 140 minus 80 is 60,000 positive, that will be an asset on the balance sheet. In the second year, you'll go through the same journal entries. You'll debit construction in progress for the cost incurred this year, credit, accounts payable, raw materials, cash, debit accounts receivable for the amount of billings this year, credit partial billings, that contra account to the inventory, construction in progress, you'll debit cash and credit accounts receivable for any cash you actually receive from the customer. That's the same under either method. The final journal entry on recognizing over time, you will debit construction expense, so you're recognizing the amount of expense actually incurred this year. You'll credit sales revenue, so you're actually recognizing the sales revenue incurred this year. And you'll debit construction in progress for the gross profit that was recognized this year. So if I take 140, plus 86, 186, the construction costs, plus the 38 gross profit 
that have all been debited, debited to the construction and progress account. The construction and progress has a debit balance of 364. The partial billings account though has a credit balance of 430. So if we net those two accounts together, we're gonna have a negative balance. We show that negative balance on the balance sheet as a liability in that second year. That's what we were talking about a couple slides ago. 2019, do the same journal entries. Debit your construction in progress, 314 for the cost for that year. Debit accounts receivable, credit partial billings for the remaining 270 of billings you have to complete, which will give you a total billings of 700,000. Debit cash and credit accounts receivable for the amount of cash the customer paid this year. Then we will debit construction expenses for the amount of construction expenses. That's 314. We'll credit sales revenue for the amount of sales revenue recognized this year. And we will debit construction in progress for the amount of gross profit. The difference there. So now our construction in progress has a $700,000 debit balance. Our partial billings has a 700,000 credit balance. When the project is complete, we reduce those balances to zero. So we're only using those accounts during construction to track partial billings and cost plus gross profit to date on the project. When the project's done, debit partial billings, because you normally credited it, credit construction in progress. You've now sold that asset it's gone and um, it's been accounted for. Now under the, at a point in time, you will debit partial buildings and credit construction revenue for 700,000 on the last day um, of the project. So now you're showing all the revenue in one year. You'll debit construction expense for the total cost and credit construction in progress for the 600,000 that's currently in that account. So you're essentially just moving all of your costs into an expense account in one year and all your revenue that you've built for all in one year. So that's how we handle partial I'm sorry, um, construction over time. And like I said, that's been around for many years and it's normal. How do we recognize this and present it in our financial statements? Well, here it is on the income statement. Each year we will have be recognizing gross profit on our income statement for that amount recognized because what's on our income statement? We reported the revenue, we subtracted the construction expenses. So gross profit automatically comes out. Look at accounts receivable on the balance sheet. It would have a $30,000 balance at the end of first year. The difference between what we build and how much cash we received. The construction in progress, as I said, costs and profit not yet billed. So basically that's saying, here's the amount of revenue that has not been billed yet as of the end of the first year, because that's what costs and profit, recognized profit are, revenue. So since that's positive, it shows as an asset. But remember in the second year, it's negative because the partial billings were 430, but the construction in progress only has a balance of 364. So we build more than we've actually earned. We've billed more than the cost and recognized profit so far of 66,000. So it shows up as a current liability. And then in the last year, it's just gross profit we're recognizing. Those other accounts have all been zeroed out. And if we've collected all the cash, accounts receivable would be zero as well. And then you would have a note in your um, notes to your financial statements. And there's more you could read about. This is if you recognized um, revenue at a point in time. So you could take a look at that. It's the same information, it's just that we would be showing it the gross profit over time instead of at a specific, I'm sorry, we would be showing it at a specific date instead of over time.
What happens if there's a loss on our contract? Well, there's two major types of losses that can occur. Sometimes we occur a loss just in one of the years that we are doing the project for, or we can have an overall loss on our contract. Costs exceed what we are actually bringing in as revenue. How do we handle that? Well, let's look at an example. In 2018, Cameron estimates that the cost to complete um, that, that stadium are really 364 instead of 264. So in 2018, they've already incurred 286,000. They expect to um, have 364,000 more or a total cost of 650,000. So if you take 286 over 650, 44% of the project is complete by the end of 2018. So 44% of the revenue or 308 should be recognized. We've already recognized 140 of it. So 168,000 is the amount of rec uh, revenue to be recognized in 2018, which is correct. But in 2018, remember, our costs were 186000 So in that year, we actually end up with a gross loss instead of a gross profit. As long as it's just in that year, it's not a big deal. If you take a look, we still have a profit overall on this project of $50,000. $700,000 dollars 650 So we would just record it as we normally would. But what happens if there's an overall loss? Take a look at this. If instead the total costs are expected to be 715,000. Okay. That means the overall loss on this project is going to be 15,000. What do they do? If it's rec if you are recognizing revenue over time, Cameron has to remove the gross profit they've recognized to date. So reverse what they did last year and show the current overall loss of 15,000, even though they're not finished with the project. Once you know an overall loss can occur, you must recognize it. So what they'll do is debit construction expense and credit construction in progress and construction revenue to remove and record, remove the gross profit from last year and record the extra amount of expense this year that, rec that represents that $15,000 loss. Okay, and they use a provision for a loss on contract account to hold that $15,000. If it's revenue recognized at a point in time, they'll also recognize the loss in 2018. They do not wait till 2019 to record that overall loss. So if you're still going to have an overall gross profit, you just have a, a, a one year loss, no big deal. But when your contract overall will um, indicates a loss, you must record it in the year you feel you're going to have that loss. So that concludes our discussion on revenue recognition, all those specific points about um, First of all, identifying your contract, identifying the parts in the contract with regards to performance obligation and unique items within it, determining the transaction price, allocating the transaction price, and determining when to recognize revenue. And then in the later part of our chapter here, we looked at how we determine and, and record um, profits on long-term projects. So if you have any questions, please post them to the discussion board.